All right, well, please take your Bibles and turn in them to 2 Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3. You're looking at verses 14 to 17 this morning. Titled this message, Bible Basics. Bible basics. This is a fundamental passage on the scriptures. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verses 14 to 17. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. All scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. Let's pray one more time. Father, we just ask that you would use your word now as we've just sung, that you would speak to us through your word. As we study a passage about your word, that we would grow in love for the scriptures and um, and that because we want to grow in our love for you. We thank you for your revelation to us, for its power, for its authority, for its sufficiency, for its clarity. Lord, we thank you for it because we need it. And so we pray you'd help us now as we study. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, NFL football coach Vince Lombardi was about the fundamentals of football, the basics. Uh, there's a story uh, one time, as he's just known for emphasizing blocking and tackling, when he, on one occasion, the Green Bay Packers lost to an inferior squad, and Coach Lombardi called a practice uh, and the, the very next morning. And Lombardi began with the team there by saying, okay, we go back to the basics this morning. Holding a football high for all to see, he continued to yell, gentlemen, This is a football. This is a football. Now, his point was to take these players back to the fundamentals, back to the basics, and yet consider who he's talking to. He's talking to professional football players. They know what a football is. And yet his point is to emphasize the basics. We're going to just strip it all back down to the utter basics. Let me reintroduce you to this sport This would be uh, uh, silly if we applied this to other areas. Imagine speaking to a maestro and saying, maestro, this is a baton, right? Or or marine, this is a rifle, right? Or librarian, this is a book, right? Just introducing something to the, someone to the utter basics. Well, in the spirit of Vince Lombardi, I want to say, this is a Bible, And we are going to look at a passage that is utterly fundamental when it comes to our understanding of the Bible. It is a passage about the Bible, the Bible speaking about the Bible. To start, as we look to the basics of the Bible, the Bible isn't a book. It's actually a library of books. It's a library of 66 books, 39 in the Old Testament, 27 in the New It's written over a period of about 1,500 years, between 1450 B.C. to the first century A.D. There are many different authors, about 40 different authors, all from vastly different backgrounds, writing in three different languages. Hebrew in the Old Testament primarily, with a little bit of Aramaic, especially in the book of Daniel in the middle, and then Greek in the New Testament. There are various genres in the the Bible. There's narrative, there's prophecy, there's epistle, there's uh, the gospels. We have law sections, there's genealogies, all kinds of genres. So we have this compilation, this, this library of books compiled for us, and yet a complete 66 books I don't know if you ever wonder why, why do we have these 66 books and no other? That's a basic question. Why don't we believe in the Apocrypha as inspired by God, as authoritative? Well, the short answer is that you just look at what Jesus believed, right? Jesus believed that the 39 books of his Bible, of his day, 
which was, is the 39 books of our Bible. That was the Bible of his day, the Jewish Old Testament. They didn't call it the Old Testament because they didn't believe in the New Testament. But they, their, their scriptures were the same as ours. And Jesus affirmed the Old Testament canon, if you will, the, those, those grouping of books that, that we have as our Old Testament. He affirmed those as scripture. He quoted from them. And so he affirmed the same uh, Old Testament that we have. And then he authorized and authenticated the, the apostles to write the New Testament. We have that in John 14 and John 16, that he would bring to mind the things that he wanted them to write about his ministry with them. That's the Gospels. And then he, would, he said, I have much more to say to you, but the helper will come. The Holy Spirit will come and he will instruct you in all things. And so the Holy Spirit would come in and reveal more. That's the epistles and revelation. Which the New Testament is written by either an apostle or a close associate of an apostle. So Jesus authorizes these 12 to author the rest of the, the New Testament, to write the New Testament. And so with that, we have this completed work that God has for us. And when the apostles passed over, they were the foundation of the church, uh, the, 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 the pillar and foundation of the truth. And so we have a, a sufficient word here in these 66 books. Now, what you believe about the Bible is going to determine much about what you do with the Bible, right? If you, if you don't believe it is the word of God, then it's unlikely that you're going to spend a lot of time studying the Bible and mining its depths. Uh, but if you believe that this book is what it claims to be, it's going to reshape your life. It's going to direct your life. You're going to love this book. You're going to seek out its treasures and seek to understand it better, to share it with others. What you do with the Bible says a lot about what you believe about the Bible. So if you just look at someone's uh, actions with the Bible, what they do with the Bible, it will reveal their commitments that are underlying, their convictions about it. We know this with other things. If you see someone who's really into uh, a hobby or a sport or watching a sport, uh, you can see that the time they allot to that activity reveals their commitment to it, their love for it. And so we can look at our, uh, what we do with the Bible and, and discern what we believe about the Bible. It has everything to do with our continuance in our faith and our service. Now, we're looking at 2 Timothy 3. And as we look at this passage, I want us to answer three questions. Actually, really, it's going to lead to a fourth. I'm going to sneak a fourth in there. Four, four questions about the Bible uh, so that you will be motivated to continually learn the scriptures and to consistently live the scriptures. To continually learn the scriptures and, cons- and to consistently live the scriptures based on these three, these three questions that lead. Really, the fourth question is what we're going to do with the Bible. Now, the psalmist in Psalm 19 says about the Bible that it is his greatest possession and it is his greatest pleasure. He, he says it's, it's more valuable than, than much gold. And he says it's sweeter also than honey. Like if the psalmist had Dairy Queen blizzards, he would have said it's better than a Dairy Queen blizzard, right? You know, it's a, it's, he picked something that was delicious, that was, that was satisfying. And he said it's, it's better than that. Think of an iPhone advertisement. They do it every time. You know, no matter, it's, it could be just one little slight new thing and they have it and it's like floating in midair and it's a nice British accent. So we're appealed to it, you know, and it's, you know, the new iPhone can do more than any other iPhone, right? And it's like, they're appealing to you. They're trying to entice you with the iPhone. They're trying to say, buy this product. Let me tell you what an iPhone is. Let me tell you what an iPhone does. Let me tell you, you know, all these things about it and it's new features and it's pixels and camera. And you're like, I need that. I need to get that. And, uh, and so we, they appeal to us by telling us all about it and how it's going to improve our lives. Well, I kind of want to treat this morning's sermon like that like an iPhone commercial, right? But it's a Bible commercial, right? It's to say, I want to entice you with the Bible by answering these questions. Now, these questions aren't original to me. Many others have have asked these same questions about the Bible and even in this text, but they're helpful to us to unearth what it is Paul is saying to Timothy as he challenges him to continue to learn the scriptures and to continue to live the scriptures when many other in his day are deserting the scriptures. This comes in a context of apostasy, of, of those deserting the faith, of turning away. And it's, uh, it's interesting because in our day, many people are, I say many, but we, it's publicized more that people turning away from the faith, pe- 
preachers, pastors uh, who once professed the faith, even uh, a conservative evangelical faith, walking away, deserting, showing that they never truly were saved. And, And so even in a context like that, Paul is telling Timothy, don't you turn away. Don't you desert. Don't you leave the scriptures. Continue in the truth. Continue in the faith. And so I want us to, to, to look at these questions. What is, the, what is the Bible? What is the Bible for? What does the Bible do? And what should we do with the Bible in light of those things? And so by answering these questions, I hope to motivate you to continue to learn and live the scriptures. So first, let's ask, what is the Bible? What is the Bible? Well, John MacArthur writes this, Scripture, first of all, and above all, is from God and about God, his self-revelation to fallen mankind. And Paul gives some descriptors of the Bible in 2 Timothy. He says in verse 15 that it is the sacred scriptures, the sacred writings, the sacred writings that he's given to us. There's our first descriptor of what the Bible is, sacred writings. This is sometimes written on our Bibles on the side or on the front, Holy Bible, right? Holy Bible or Santa Biblia, right? It's, it's the Holy Bible, This is a term really to designate the Hebrew Old Testament scriptures, the sacred writings, because Paul is writing in the context, though 2 Timothy comes much later uh, in in the writing of the canon because Paul is getting near death. And he's this is one of his 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 last letter that he writes. And uh, and so some of the New Testament has already been written at this point. Much of it has. And yet he's, he's looking back at the scriptures that Timothy knew from his childhood, which are the Old Testament scriptures, those 39 books. This isn't just any book. This is not just any other religious text. This is the only authoritative text sitting in judgment on every other text. In fact, this is the, this is the book that helps us read every other book. This is the book that helps us to discern what is a good book and what is a bad book based upon uh, what, what is true, good, and beautiful in those uh, other works. So it's the, the sacred writings. They are holy. It is also referred to as God's words. Look at verse 16. He says, all scripture is breathed out by God. So these are God's words. This may be the most important statement about the scriptures in the scriptures. If you want to know, like, what, what is the... What does the Bible think about itself? Now, the Bible's not a person, right? But what, what does the Bible say about itself? Well, it claims to be the words of God, the very words of God. Paul's speaking about the origin and the nature of Scripture. And this is what we call the doctrine of the inspiration of Scripture, that the Scriptures are inspired. Maybe you've heard that and you've gone, what does that mean? Does that mean like so-and-so was inspired. Leonardo da Vinci was inspired to write this piece of, or to paint this piece of, uh, this, this art. Or, uh, you know, the Beatles were inspired to write this album, you know. And, and we just think of artists who are inspired to do things. They're, they're, uh, that, that's not the idea in the inspiration of Scripture. Inspiration refers to the process by which God communicates his word through those who wrote the Bible in the original languages. We believe uh, in inspiration. We specifically believe in, hang on, take it all in, verbal plenary inspiration, okay? Actually, those three terms are all found in this text. We'll explain each of them. Each word, though, is vital to an orthodox doctrine of Scripture. So let's take each at a time. Verbal, this means the words, the words. He says, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Scripture speaks to the words themselves. Although mainly referring to the Old Testament scriptures, this would include what would be written in the future, in the New Testament. Uh, Paul uses the same word, the same word for scripture in Greek. He uses it elsewhere in the New, or, or Paul doesn't use it. It's used in the New Testament for other New Testament writings. So if there's this category known as scripture, uh, it, it's, it's, of course, speaking about the Old Testament, but then when it, it's applied to New Testament writers, their works are called Scripture. They're in the same category. So, for instance, in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16, Peter is talking about Paul's writings. And in verse 15, he says, And count the patience of our Lord as salvation, just as our beloved brother Paul also wrote to you according to the wisdom given him, as he does in all his letters, 
which he speaks in them of these matters. There are some things in them that are hard to understand. (laughs) Did you love that? Peter's like, some of Paul's writings are more challenging than others. But then he says, which the ignorant and unstable twist to their own destruction as they do the other scriptures, the other scriptures. So the main point to take away for our purposes this morning is simply the fact that Peter calls the writings of Paul scripture, the same thing that the Old Testament writings were. Also, uh, in 1 Peter, excuse me, 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy, Paul speaks about the writings of Luke, and he calls them scripture. Uh, 1 Timothy 5, verse 18, Paul quotes from two different places. He says, for the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox when it treads out the grain. Bonus points, you know where that is? Deuteronomy, it's from Deuteronomy. Then he says, and the laborer deserves his wages. Where does that come from? Luke. It comes from Luke. So he quotes from Deuteronomy and he quotes from Luke in the same verse. And he says, the scripture says. So he applies the writings of Luke to scripture. Paul himself will say, if anyone doesn't receive what I'm saying as a command from the Lord, uh, he, he, so he, he speaks about his writings as a command from the Lord in 1 Corinthians 14. 1 Corinthians 14, 37. If anyone thinks that he is a prophet or spiritual, he should acknowledge that the things I am writing to you are a command of the Lord. So Paul understood his own writings to be uh, uh, a writings from the Lord. This is just a funny story that came into my head. Uh, I was once at... um, uh, out of town. I was at an ordination of someone uh, who I didn't know, but I just got invited to it. And I didn't know this church. And this guy was getting ordained to be a pastor. And they gave him a few minutes to talk about, uh, you know, whatever, uh, give a little message. And he started talking about how the, the, the writers of the, the Bible didn't know that what they were writing was scripture. And I'm like, wait, this guy just got ordained? What? And I'm like thinking, lean over to Ashley. He's like, what? what's going on here? Uh, of course they knew. Paul's saying, hey, what I'm writing to you, if you don't obey this, you're disobeying God, not just me. Uh, of course they understood what they were doing was uh, writing scripture. Jesus authorized them to do it. He told them, hey, the Holy Spirit's going to bring to your mind these things, and you're going to write them down. Of course they knew. So these are God's words. It, so it's, it's verbal. It's the scriptures themselves. It refers not just to the ideas behind the words, right, but to the actual words themselves. Because sometimes a truth hangs on the tense of a verb. Uh, Paul says uh, in Galatians 3, he he talks about the difference between uh, seeds, plural, and seeds, singular. And he makes a theological point based on that. So the the tense, singular, or uh, or whether it's singular or plural, uh, it makes a difference. Or Jesus will, will talk about the tense of a verb and how that's significant at times. And so we see that it's very detailed. It's very precise, the very words themselves, not just the ideas. Every part of scripture is God breathed as well. So not only verbal, but plenary. Plenary means like full or all. It's speaking to every scripture. So the idea is we believe in an inspiration that is uh, about the words themselves, not just the ideas, but also we believe that it applies to all of the scriptures, every scripture, Old and New Testament. Some uh, in the past tried to say that this could be translated all scripture, um, rather, oh, excuse me, that, that um, all inspired scripture is, uh, is profitable, and as if to, to distinguish between uh, a category of scripture that was inspired by God and a category that wasn't. But that just simply doesn't work with the way this is constructed. The idea is that every passage of scripture, every word is in this category of God breathed. And so it's, it's verbal, it's plenary, it applies to everything, and then it's God-breathed, it's inspired. So verbal, plenary, inspiration. What does it mean to be inspired? Well, the word here, if you look, it says breathed out by God. Breathed out by God. Now, the ESV doesn't say inspired, other translations do, because they're trying to bring out the actual sense of what's being spoken here. Because they understand inspired is open to a lot more interpretation and mis- misleading interpretation uh, of what this means. Breathed out is actually m- much better uh, in conveying what's really being said here. It's a compound verb. It's made up of two words, the words for God and breath. A God breathed is, is a literal translation. The idea is not even the idea, it's not the idea of breathing in, but it's breathing out, expiring breath. That's the idea here. So the idea 
Paul is communicating is that when you read the scriptures, it's like the breath of God. It's, it's, the, it's the very voice of God, the very words of God speaking. And, and of course, this takes us back to Genesis 1 and 2, that God spoke, right? And things appeared, things happened. He spe- the psalmist speaks this way in Psalm 33, 6, uh, about the, the breath of God. Matthew 4, 4, Jesus says, man doesn't live by bread alone, but by every word that comes from the mouth of God. So if you breathe out, you feel your breath, and that's the idea. It's coming, the source is from God. He's breathing these words out. So many have have rightfully said, the doctrine of inspiration means that when the scriptures speak, God speaks. You're getting the very words of God. So the meaning of the text is that the whole of scripture, as well as its smallest parts, finds its origin and source in God. Down to the smallest, the words, the tenses, the the phrases, as well as the totality of scripture is breathed out by God. You know, we look at most of our products, maybe if we even turn over this pulpit, we'd find a statement that says, made in China, right? Most of our stuff is made in China. That's the stamp upon it. it. It reveals where this came from, where its source is. Well, every scripture has the stamp spoken by God, breathed out by God. That's the point that he's making. Uh, look at, it's not far away. So 1 Thessalonians, just to the left. 1 Thessalonians 2, Paul writes there, in verse 13, he says, and we also thank God constantly for this, that when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it not as the word of men, but is what it really is, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. And so this is interesting because it in fact was written by men, but Paul is saying behind that is the, the true author, the divine author. And so people, I, I've talked to people before and the, I start talking about the Bible with them and they'll go, well, the Bible is written by men. And I'm like, and your point is like what? Uh, and I know what their point is. Their point is like, oh, well, just, they just made this up. And, you know, we file these men or those men. Of course, we acknowledge that the Bible is written by men. But our point is to say these were men who were moved by the Holy Spirit to write what God desired to have written. That's the idea there. And so the scriptures are, have a dual authorship feature to them. In order to understand this, we, we look at 2 Peter 1, and Peter tells us a little bit more about the process of inspiration. Now, we don't know exactly how this worked, but he gives us a little bit more in an illustrative description. In 2 Peter 1, verse 19, he says this, and we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you do well to pay attention to a lamp, as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from one's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man. But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. So here's human writers with their own personalities, their own experiences. And God is using them and all of those experiences that he has brought about to shape them to write exactly what he wants. So that's why you can have, you can read Paul and you can read Peter and go, Yeah, these are different guys. They had different personalities. They had different styles. And you can notice that because God doesn't override the style and the personality of the human author while communicating his message, but works with that. It's an amazing thought that that God does this. Now, this word carried along, it's like the idea of, I mean, just think, here's one illustration is if you threw a stick into a river and the, the, the stick is taken, it's the stick, but it's taken by the stream of the current. It's moved along, it's carried along by the current. That's kind of this idea. Or a sail, how a sail is opened up and it carries the, the ship along. In fact, in Acts 27, verse 15, when Paul is on this ship and, and it says in verse 15, and when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and were driven along. It's just like, we just let it go. It just took us along. That's how he uses the same word driven along in verse 17. It's the same phrase carried along here by the Holy Spirit. So it's like these, these human authors were like sails and, and the spirit moved in them to author the scriptures, to get exactly what he desired. Now, not to get too detailed, but we understand that God is sovereign over every detail of us. And so he is so meticulously sovereign that he can 
allow people to have their own personalities, their own uh, experiences, and yet accomplish exactly what he wants accomplished. I mean, that's what we understand when we think about events that take place, that people act freely doing what they want to do most, and yet God is absolutely sovereign over that action, that, that both are true. And that's just an illustration in the scriptures that God is able to get exactly what he wants written in the scriptures and yet do it through human beings working according to their desires because he's moving their desires to write exactly what he desires and yet in their own personalities and distinctive ways. So that's really the doctrine of inspiration. Now, God sometimes dictated things to his people directly and didn't work through uh, a human author. I mean, the Ten Commandments, it's written by the finger of God, it says. Of course, God doesn't have a finger, God is spirit, but God directly reveals this and and makes it appear on the stone for Moses to, to walk down the mountain with. But the normal pattern is for God to work through a human author to communicate his message. Now, it's important to recognize that it's the scriptures themselves in particular that are said to have this quality of inspiration, not so much the authors themselves. So the point I want to make here is that it wasn't that Paul's grocery list was breathed out by God, right? That was inspired, had the same quality. In fact, Paul wrote some other correspondence with the Corinthians. We don't have those letters and we don't need to have those letters. They're not included in the scriptures because it's not to say that every single thing Paul ever wrote was scripture, but that these particular writings that God moved him to write are in fact scripture and recognizes so by the church. And so what is the Bible? It is the very words of God, God's self-revelation to us, coming to us primarily through human authors carried along by the Holy Spirit. It is not just the words of men, it is, but it is the words of God. And Paul commends the Thessalonians for treating it that way. He says, you guys didn't just treat it as the words of men, like you would any other book, but truly as what it really is, the words of God. And so now that we know the origin of the scriptures, we can better appreciate their worth in our lives. So what is the Bible? It's the God-breathed scriptures. What is the Bible for? Number two, what is the Bible for? Look at verse 16. It is, he says it is profitable. It's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. This word profitable, it means it's helpful. It's useful. It's beneficial. It's advantageous. And all of it is profitable. I mean, the book of Leviticus, just as profitable. Romans, profitable. Some, it seems easier to make profit out of Romans than it does Leviticus, but there's profit there. In fact, Paul reminds us on two occasions of the profitability of the Old Testament. In Romans chapter 15, verse four, he says, for whatever was written in former days was written for our instruction, that through endurance and through the encouragement of the scriptures, we might have hope. So I ask you this, do you need encouragement? Do you need endurance in the trials you're facing? Do you need hope? Read the Old Testament. (laughs) That's what Paul's saying. These are given for our encouragement, for our hope, for our endurance. He says very much the same in 1 Corinthians 10, 11, as he says this, these are written for our instruction, the Old Testament scriptures. Part of the purpose for which God gave the scriptures are found in these four actions here, teaching, reproof, correction, and training in righteousness. He says it's for teaching, it's profitable, it's, it's useful for teaching. This means instructions in the truths of scripture, the doctrines found, it, uh, the, the, the things described herein. Paul says, well, we just read in 15.4 of Romans, whatever was written in early times written for our instruction. That's the same word for the teaching. Titus speaks, uh, Paul speaks in Titus 2.10 about the doctrine of God our Savior, the doctrine the summations of truth. It teaches us. The scriptures tell us about God, about our creator. It tells us about us, who we are, how we're made, what our problem is. It tells us about the way of salvation. It tells us about the person of Christ, the work of Christ. It tells us where everything is headed. It tells us about uh, how to think about life. It gives us teaching. The scriptures reveal or communicate God to us. And therefore, they are to be used for knowing the one true God. Think about how an adopted child often has a time in their life when they they really desire to find out more about their parents, about their their father. We as adopted children of God should long just as much to know more about our adoptive father, our God. We are adopted into the family of God through 
our union with Christ, the Son of God. And so the scriptures are the means by which we learn and grow in our understanding of our Father. It's just his revelation to us about himself. So it's for teaching. It's for, uh, it's not only that for, but, it, but it's for reproof. Let me back up for one second. Here's an A.W. Tozer quote. This will bless you. He says, the Bible is not an end in itself, but a means to bring men to an intimate and satisfying knowledge of God, that they may enter into him, that they may delight in his presence, may taste and know the inner sweetness of the very God himself in the core and center of our hearts. Mm, yeah, sounds good. I like it. Teaching. So reproof is number two. This is referring to warnings about beliefs and behaviors. Warnings refers to refuting error, rebuking sin. The scriptures uh, expose our sin. It reproves us. And it, uh, it, it, it points us, it, it illuminates the truth rather. It teaches us. So it illuminates the truth, teaching, and it rebukes us for and exposes error. If you're going in the wrong direction, you want to know it. Like if you're on a ship and you get off course just, just slightly, in a, in a long time, it's going to take you way off of course. Or if you're flying and you get dialed in just slightly, a few degrees off, you're going to end up in a different location given enough time. And so the scriptures come to us and they, they correct us. They point out areas where we need reproof. And then not only that, it doesn't just whack us, right? But then it gives us correction, number three redirection, restoration is the idea. Think of your GPS, right? You've, you've followed your GPS and I, I'm happy to say we've been here for a few months and I'm using my GPS less and less every day, right? I just drove around the other day. I was like, I didn't use a GPS at all. I figured it out and I just made a few extra turns and I'm like, okay, I know how to get there. So uh, I'm getting more confident. Um, so the correction idea is, let's say you make a wrong turn and what does your GPS do? It says rerouting, right? Rerouting, it takes you from where you are and it gets you back to how to, get, how to get back to where you were intending to go. So the scriptures, they have this reproof effect in our lives where it points out something that is wrong as a Christian that we ought not to be doing a wrong belief, a wrong behavior. But it doesn't leave us there and just goes, stop it, right? But it actually redirects us and says rerouting. It takes us from where we are and it shows us how we are to then proceed from there, right? That's so encouraging, it, the, the scriptures pick you up where you are. It, it, we, God starts with us where we are, right? It doesn't say, okay, you're here. You got way off. You need to like figure out how to get back to this point and then talk to me, right? No, the Bible says wherever you are, wherever you've gone off and gotten yourself to, the Bible actually gives you instructions on life and godliness from that point. It goes rerouting and goes, okay, here's the new direction now from how to get from point A to point B. So the scriptures rebuke us and then reroute our lives based on where we are. And then third, it trains us in righteousness. And this is kind of a big picture idea. It refers to what we might call discipleship, mentoring in the truth. It's the process and pursuit of holiness. To be instructed as to how to continue on in the right direction is what training in righteousness is. Titus 2, 14 says, the grace of God has appeared, training us, training us, to renounce evil. And, and, and the scriptures uh, often have this balance to it where it does two things. It tells us what we need to put off and then it tells us what we need to put on. There is a replacement idea that we, it identifies an area of sin, but it doesn't just say, stop it. It says, here is the replacement to that, right? Because if we just, if we just say, I'm just gonna stop doing that, well, our hearts will find something else to pursue uh, that is off as well. And so it'll say, not only, not only is this wrong, but then here is the replacement. Here is the right way to think about this. Here's the, here's the right behavior. And here's the reason for that. And so we see these four things and, and what the scriptures are meant uh, for, what they do. What is the Bible for? Well, it's profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, for training in righteousness. So do you know the teachings of scripture? Let me just encourage you that maturity in Christianity means growing in part in a workable knowledge of the Bible, that you grow in just knowing what the Bible says about things. We don't all start at the same point. Some of us grew up in Christian homes. Some of us did not. But we just are seeking constantly to grow more and more and go, I just need to learn more about what the Bible says about this or that and grow. Paul was encouraged in the Romans that they simply had the scriptures 
And because of that, here's what he said about them. Romans 15, 14. I myself am satisfied about you, my brothers and sisters, that you yourselves are full of goodness, filled with all knowledge and able to instruct one another. You guys know how to counsel each other. You know how to meet each other's needs and and help each other, encourage each other. Why? Because you are full of all knowledge. You have the scriptures. And so what areas of change is the Bible calling you to? What beliefs or behaviors in your life need most attention in your conformity to Christ in this new year? What is the Bible for? Well, this is what we see. For It's profitable for these four things. And then we see, number three, what does the Bible do? What does the Bible do? See this in verse 15 and verse 17. Number one, the Bible can save you. The Bible can save you. Look at verse 15. It says, And from from childhood, you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. Now, in context, we said he's, he's talking about the Old Testament scriptures, how they were able to lead Timothy to a true knowledge of God, how to be saved from his sins. Jesus said in John chapter five, that it was the scriptures that spoke about him. They spoke about the Savior. In, in John chapter 5, verse 39, it says, You search the scriptures because you think that in them you have eternal life, and it is they that bear witness about me. In verse 46, For if you believed Moses, you would, have, you would believe me, for he wrote of me. So there's an anticipation of the Messiah. It is the scriptures that give us the knowledge of salvation. 1 Peter 1.23 says, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable through the living and abiding word of God. You know, the Philippian jailer, when Paul and, uh, was in jail, he, he, this, they're, they're singing hymns, <laughs> and, and, which is very odd to do when you're in prison. And uh, the, the jailer uh, says to Paul, What must I do to be saved? What must I do to be saved? And this is the simplicity of what Paul's answer is. He says, believe in the Lord Jesus and you'll be saved. In other words, receive the Lord Jesus. Rest in him. Stop striving in your own works and just trust in him. The word of God is able to bring salvation. Jesus, uh, or excuse me, John wrote in his gospel about Jesus. And he said the very purpose of his gospel, the writings of the gospel of John were for this purpose. In John 20, verse 30. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book, but these are written so you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. So the scriptures are written that you might have life. They're written to explain your problem, explain the creator, explain the solution so that you might be right with him. So that you might know for certain that if you were to die, that you would be right with God. And he says, he gives us more detail. He says, it is to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. That's how you have salvation, through faith in Christ Jesus. Believing in him, trusting in him, relying upon him. Knowing who Jesus is from the scriptures and then saying, he deserves all my trust and all my reliance based upon who he is and what he's done. And he says, so he points out the proper object of our faith that we would rely upon him, not ourselves. So the Bible can save you. The Bible can save you. Secondly, the Bible can sanctify you. The Bible can sanctify you. If you have trusted in Christ, had faith in Christ, the Lord saves you and then begins to transform you. In verse 17, the Bible can sanctify you. Verse 17, he says, that the man of God may be complete, equipped for every good work. So the Bible has this equipping, this completing, maturing uh, process in our lives. This word complete means adequate, proficient, capable, able to meet all the demands placed upon him. So the Bible is sufficient for all the challenges in life that we face. Think about Batman's utility belt, right? He's got this utility belt and he's always got uh, what he needs in the moment. And my favorite illustration of this is, I don't know if you've ever seen that old, old Batman with Adam West and Burt Ward. And there's this movie they made and and it's like really cheesy and everything. And there's a moment when he's on this helicopter and and Batman goes down, down this like rope ladder uh, to to fight this, uh, to, to, I don't know, check something out. And a shark bites his leg. I mean, it's super cheesy. And he's got this shark hanging off his leg and he's trying to get it off. And he yells up to Robin, who's flying the helicopter. And he says, Robin, Robin, bring me the shark repellent bat spray. You know, he has 
Everything he needs. He's fully equipped for any situation. And, and Robin, open, he, there's, a, there's, a, there's a glass, you know, uh, covering and he opens it up and it, inside it says shark repellent bat, bat spray, uh, manta ray repellent bat spray, and it's got all these other like sea creature, you know, octopus repellent bat spray, and it's got all these different ones for just such an instance. And he brings the shark repellent, brings it down, and Batman sprays it. It's like an aerosol can, and and it it falls off of him. He has everything he needs. He's sufficient. That's the idea. It's like everything you would possibly need. Why would you need shark repellent bat spray? Well, you might need it, and there it is when you need it. This, that's what the scriptures are. It, it gives us everything we need for life and godliness. Second Peter 1, 3 says, whatever you might, be, might face in life that would, that would apply to you honoring God, living in his world in a way that pleases him, he supplied it for you. He supplied it. You don't have to go outside of the scriptures. He equips you. The idea is, is use of a wagon or a rescue boat, which is fully outfitted for its task. There are many challenges in life, but the scriptures give us all we need to face each one of them in a God-honoring way. It's for every good work. Jesus said, he prayed to his father, sanctify them in the truth. Your word is truth. It is the scriptures that are the truth that will grow us and change us and sanctify us. For every struggle in the Christian life, we might say, there is an app for that, (laughs) or there is a verse for that, or there's a truth for that. Right? And of course, we don't, when we're trying to help people, we don't just throw a verse, you know, take these two verses and call me in the morning kind of approach. But we do want to accurately apply a biblical worldview to people and, 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 and help them think through the issues that they're facing in life so that they might apply it. All other self help books point you in other directions. All other psychological approaches, there are so many different theories, uh, and they all have a different view about what the goal is. Like, what, is, what are we trying to make people into? Like, what are we trying to get people? What does a healthy person look like? Uh, what are we trying to get them from to? Where, where, are we, where is the GPS supposed to redirect them towards? What's the destination? They all have different theories about what that is. But the scriptures would say, the answer is Christ-likeness. Christ-likeness. That's the rerouting. That's where we're headed. And it would point us back to Christ over and over again. And actually, that is the very power of us growing in sanctification. It's not just by us saying, no, I shouldn't do that. But it's actually what the Bible does. It says that's sinful. It, it actually hurts your communion with God. And then it presents us the glory of Christ. And so we actually look to Christ so that our desires change so that we don't want our sin because we want Christ. We want him. And so it's not just a matter of saying, don't do that, do this. But it's put off this, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul says, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. As you focus upon him, your heart is changed. David, of course, describes all that the scriptures do in Psalm 19. In Psalm 19, he gives this description of the scriptures, this amazing description. He talks about the revelation of God in creation, but then he speaks more specifically about the word. He says, the law of Yahweh is perfect, reviving the soul. The testimony of Yahweh is sure, making wise the simple. The precepts of Yahweh are right, rejoicing the heart. The commandment of Yahweh is pure, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, enduring forever. The rules of Yahweh are true and righteous altogether. And so these are all the things that the scriptures do for us. In Psalm 119, that that super long chapter in Psalms, it describes and extols the word of God. And really it can be summarized, it's been summarized in three primary ways. What the psalmist thinks about the word of God, what the psalmist feels about the word of God, and what the psalmist does with the word of God. And so what he thinks and feels about it determines what he does with the Bible. And so what do we do then forth with the Bible? What do we do with it? Having answered these other questions, well, we were then motivated to follow through on what God would call us to. First, we practice the Bible, and then we preach and proclaim the Bible. Verse 14, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you learned it. He says, Timothy, continue in it. Continue in it. As for you, in contrast to the false teachers who've deserted the faith, you hold on to the truth. Continue in it. Learn the scriptures. Live the scriptures. Continue to be satisfied in your heart with Christ and all that he is. Continue to look again and again at him. Continue. Do it habitually, continually. Abide in him. Continue. Remain. Stay put. Live. Dwell. He doesn't encourage him to go to other places to find the truth, but to continue to come back to this one source. We never move beyond this textbook of truth. 
One writer says this, our task is to learn more fully what has already been given to us. We first learn the scriptures and then we, we firmly believe them. He, he says, continue in what you've learned and have firmly believed. He, he had grown in these, these convictions, these deep convictions based on what he learned. They became his own. We learn the scriptures in a lot of ways. We listen to good preaching. We read the Bible ourselves. We read good books about the Bible, helping us understand it. We talk to other people and study the Bible with other people so that we can grow in it. Lots of ways to do that. And it helps us to grow and deepen and harden in our convictions. And then he says, you need to remember who you learned it from. Where did Timothy learn the scriptures? Well, his mother Eunice and his grandmother Lois in chapter one, verse five. Paul's probably also included in this group. He didn't have a believing father. And so Paul was uh, a father figure to Timothy and instructed him in the word. Godly parents and godly mentors can have a profound impact in teaching the word as as well as modeling the the word for children and young people. And there's an interplay here between learning the content of scripture from these people and watching their consistent conduct in line with the scripture, which does, by the way, include confessing sin right? And repenting of sin, modeling what it means to for, forgive and, and, and confess sin. Children can easily spot hypocrisy. I used to tell uh, parents in, our, in our, the church I was a youth pastor at, I would say, we're going to teach the Bible in such a way that if you're, not, if you're claiming to be a Christian, you're not living like that at home, your kids are going to come to one of two conclusions, either that all of this is just make-believe, it's all made up, it's all fake, or that you're not a Christian <laughs> because they were going, okay, that's what a Christian Christian confesses their sin, they repent of it. My parents don't ever do that. <laughs> it's like, uh, they're not a Christian. Or this is all made up. This is just pretend. And so there's this importance that, that, uh, of, of teaching the truth, but also living the truth. And Timothy got both of those and had a great legacy handed to him. Uh, uh, Ezra models this for us. It says that Ezra, in Ezra 7.10, he set his heart to study the law of the Lord, to do it, and then to teach it. That's a great model for us, that we would study the word, then we would do it, and then we would teach it to others. And of course, we're all imperfect in this, but we're seeking to strive more and more to have our lives be consistent with the scriptures. And then, so we don't only practice the scriptures, continue in them, but we preach the scriptures. And that's what he says in chapter four, verse two, preach the word, be ready in season, out of season, reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. The only point I want to point out here is that we herald the message. If every word is truly God's words, then we must communicate it all to people. We must apply all of it to our lives and know how it applies to our lives. We want to think biblically about everything, fortify ourselves with a biblical worldview that helps us to think about each issue that we might face. Spurgeon wrote this, all other books might be heaped together in one pile and burned with less loss to the world than would be occasioned by the obliteration of a single page of the sacred volume of scripture. At their best, all other books are but as a gold leaf, requiring acres to find one ounce of, a pre- of the precious metal. But the Bible is solid gold. It contains blocks of gold, mines, and whole caverns of priceless treasure. In the mental wealth of the wisest men, there are no jewels like the truths of revelation. The thoughts of men are vanity, low and groveling at their best. But he who has given us this book has said, for my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are my ways your ways, declares the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. Let it be to you and to me a settled matter that the word of the Lord shall be honored in our minds and enshrined in our hearts. Let others speak as they may. We could sooner part with all that is sublime and beautiful or cheering and profitable in human literature than lose a single syllable from the mouth of God. Wow. May that entice you then to be in the word, to study the scriptures. And really, I mean, this can sound like law, like read your Bible more. Yeah, This is the read your Bible more message, right? We have those from time to time. But here's why. Because this is how you know God. This is how you enjoy God. Communion with God. That's what we're after. Not just reading words on a page, but reading and understanding the meaning and having our hearts thrill with our creator. So let's resolve to be lifelong students together of the scriptures, wherever we are, to just grow a little bit more. Just grow a little bit more in our understanding of the word and grow more and more in our love for God as a result. And with John Wesley, and he wrote these words. He says, I have thought, I am a creature of the day, passing through life as an arrow through the air. I am a spirit come from God and returning to God, just hovering over the great gulf, 
till a few moments hence I am no more seen. I drop into an unchangeable eternity. I want to know one thing, the way to heaven, how to land safe on that happy shore. God himself has condescended to teach me the way. For this very end, he came from heaven. He hath written it down in a book. Oh, give me that book. At any price, give me the book of God. I have it. Here is knowledge enough for me. Let me be a man of one book. Amen. May it be so. Father, thank you for this book you've given to us, the truths of scripture, for enlightening our eyes, for saving us through the scriptures. May it be that as we declare the scriptures to others, that you would save them as well. You would bring them to a knowledge of your son, the forgiveness of their sins, the joy it is to to know that Christ has paid for all of our sins. And Lord, would you sanctify us and grow us more and more that we might be more conformed to your image, pleasing in your sight through the scriptures. Make it our delight, make it our treasure, our greatest treasure, our greatest possession and pleasure, Lord. Thank you. We ask now that you would be honored as we close our service, as we sing to you, expressing our love for you. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, please stand.